Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Stock Break. My name is Josh Gilbert. Today, we're taking a look and analyzing Netflix. It's the household name that for most of us at some point in our lives has been the name that we turn to for binge watching, whether it's an episode after work or on a Sunday when we're lounging on the sofa. But before we dive into Netflix, uh, if there's anything that you'd like covered across these stocks that we analyze, please let us know. Uh, and of course, if there is a stock that you would like covered, uh, we can also break that down for you. Also, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, give us a rating, send us to your friends. Um, if you are listening to this in podcast format uh, and you would like to watch with the presentation, there is a link in the bio uh, and it will take you over to YouTube to watch alongside the presentation. Uh, and just a quick reminder that this presentation is for educational purposes only, and it should not be taken as investment advice, personal recommendation, or an offer of or solicitation to buy or sell any financial instruments. So with that out of the way, on to Netflix. Um, I think Netflix is a slightly better choice of name than its original name, which started as Kibble. Uh, I'm not actually sure I understand where they were going with that, but uh, uh, I'm glad they changed it to Netflix either way. So now here in 2023, it's hard to imagine a life without Netflix, especially given it's responsible for more than 15% of worldwide internet traffic. Uh, along its journey to being a streaming giant, they have rewarded investors with over two and a half thousand percent in return. However, 2022 wasn't plain sailing. Quarterly subscriber losses came and some of the slowest growth in its history as competition intensified. So the big question here is, can Netflix still reward investors and what will be next for the streaming giant? Well, let's find out and dive straight into it. But before we get straight into Netflix's fundamentals, into the nitty gritty, let's give you some background on Netflix and where it first started. So the company was founded in 1997 by Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph. And in 1999, Netflix began its online subscription services for movie and TV titles to be mailed to customers in DVD format. Interestingly, the idea came after Hastings actually incurred a large late fee when he failed to return a movie he rented from a movie, movie rental shop. I can probably imagine it was Blockbuster. Uh, then introduced DVDs and Hastings realized that these could be sent easily through the mail. And so the idea was born. So when we talk about video rental stores, as I just mentioned, the first name that comes to mind is more than likely Blockbuster, depending, of course, on your age, uh, for those that can remember. But it may go down as one of the biggest missed business opportunities of the century. Um, Blockbuster actually turned down an opportunity to buy Netflix for 50 million US dollars. When Netflix was approached by Blockbuster, the company still wasn't turning a profit. Some say that Blockbuster CEO, John Antico, lacked the vision to see where the home video industry was going and the changing shifts in the business under his feet. Fast forward, Netflix has obviously gone on to reward investors massively and Blockbuster is no more. So it seems that Reed Hastings had a better vision than what the Blockbuster CEO did at the time. The company then went public in 2002. Um, Netflix did grow slowly. They hit 4.2 million members by 2005, trading around $2 when it first lifted. Um, look, it, it wasn't all plain sailing. Um, it took until 2007 to get the streaming service off the ground, the streaming service as we know it today, which allowed users the ability to stream their favorite movies in their own homes, but of course only starting in the U.S., this was the tipping point for Netflix, really. Um, by this time, they'd already shipped over a billion DVDs. Um, and the stock really didn't begin to take off until around 2009 uh, when it made its way um, into that streaming service and, and it sort of moved to about $8 a share. Of course, the rest is stock market history as the shares have climbed astronomically since. Then in 2010, they expanded overseas before reaching the UK in 2012 and 190 countries by 2016. The transition wasn't completely plain sailing, though, and I'll touch on that a little bit later in the episode and, and I'll explain why it was so important a little bit later. 
One of the biggest changes that we saw from Netflix was in 2013 when they introduced its original content. So here we can think of House of Cards, Orange is the New Black. Its original content has also been a winner with subscribers. Um, its most ever streamed film was Red Notice, uh, which, as many of you know, had um, Ryan Reynolds and Dwayne Johnson. Uh, that was a Netflix original. So this was huge for the business. The introduction of streaming, uh, as I say, was the sort of the tipping point. The genius of it all was how Netflix essentially used other content creators to beat them at their own game. Um, they were licensing their content to Netflix, which essentially meant that they were giving Netflix the tools it needed to, to steal their viewership. So think Disney before it had Disney Plus. Netflix was licensing Disney films and people were turning to Netflix to then watch these films. Um, so it was pretty genius. But obviously the introduction of Netflix's original content uh, was obviously key as well. So that was some quick industry, um, some quick history. So now I want to sort of run through who is steering the Netflix ship through what is going to be a, a challenging few years. It's it's taken a, a special management team to, to sort of lead Netflix with some big pivots over the years uh, that we mentioned, whether that was the change from DVDs into streaming, um, whether that's, you know, that move now that we're seeing into advertising, we'll obviously touch on that later as well. But Netflix is, is renowned for having a strong culture and has a good history of retaining talent. Um, they have things like uncapped vacation policies as well. Essentially, if you're doing your job, um, then you can take as much leave as you want. Um, the big change, though, came last year. Reed Hastings, uh, the current CEO, um, who took over from Mark Randolph when he left the business in, in 2002, he, he actually announced that, uh, sorry, Reed Hastings announced that he would be stepping down um, as CEO and passing the reins to said Sarandos, co-CEO and chief content officer, Greg Peters, uh, who will both act together as co-CEOs. Uh, this is a big change for the business, given Hastings has navigated the business and made it what it is today. As I say, he's been at the helm since 2002. Uh, he is staying on as chairman, which is a good transition. Um, he can pull strings from the background and I think is 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 very key to, to not just sort of completely move away from the business uh, altogether. So now on to the company's financials and fundamentals. Um, Netflix doesn't like to focus on this, but it's all the focus of investors, and that is subscriber growth. Um, they don't like it that much. They even announced that it would stop offering forward guidance to try and get investors to focus on financials such as revenues. So that will be pretty interesting to see how that turns out in 2023. But on to subscribers, Netflix finished 2022 with 230 million subscribers. They added 8.9 million users for the year, um, but that was down dramatically from the 18 million additions that they had in 2021 and 27 million in 2019, um, which gives that sort of pre-pandemic comparison. Out of those 230 million subscribers, 74 million are in North America, whilst 156 million are overseas. Um, interestingly, the number of subscribers in North America actually declined in 2022, which shows that um, maybe that, that sort of market is, is stagnating. Ultimately, Netflix's international market is, is key for growth. Uh, Asia Pacific saw the highest number of net additions thanks to hit shows such as Squid Game and other local original content. We mentioned original content earlier, but that is key. Um, interestingly, thanks to that growth in the region, Netflix has realized um, that it is going to be a key region continue moving forward. They've invested $1.9 billion on local content uh, in 2023. So that's another area for investors to watch. For the full year, though, this year, the market expects Netflix to add around 19 million subscribers, a huge bounce back from 2022, taking its total just shy of 250 million subscribers. So, um, you know, a, a decent sort of breakdown across, you know, the the, the regions that we have. Uh, and of course, as I say, Asia Pacific being a key area um, for Netflix in the last couple of years. So on to revenue, as I expressed earlier, 2022 wasn't an easy year for Netflix, and, and that has shown in its revenue growth, with the company reporting the lowest year-over-year -year revenue growth in its history at just 6.5%, coming in at $31.6 billion. Um, the market does expect another slower year um, than what Netflix investors are used to, with 2023 estimates expecting revenue to rise 8.6% to $34 billion. 
Um, Netflix, as we know, has been spiking up prices for subscriptions, which has worked pretty well in terms of revenue generation. Um, for one thing, it sort of shows how much people love Netflix uh, as they have kept their subscription despite these price spikes. But we will touch on price increases a little bit later. Uh, so keep listening in as we touch on that. Um, we've also got uh, a little focus as well on total average monthly revenue per subscriber. That's currently at $11.76, which grew about 5% in 2022. The US and Canada dominates this with the average revenue per subscriber at $15.86. Um, the, the US makes up almost 50% of its revenue, showing that it continues to be a, a really, really key market. So although all, although overseas markets are really key and um you know, in Asia Pacific and, and those sorts of regions are, are really important. You know, most of the revenue is coming from from the US because that's where they can charge the largest subscription costs. So does Netflix turn its revenue into profit? Uh, it does. And Netflix has been profitable for most of its existence. 2021 was its most profitable year, generating over $5 billion in net income. Um, profitability did slow down in 2022, falling by 12% to $4.5 billion. But the market expects this to rise by 15% in 2023 to over $5 billion again. So whilst Netflix has a positive income and has shown solid profit growth, it uses a substantial amount of cash for its operating activities. The company has had to pay in advance for the right to stream content or at least have the content ready to be streamed on its platform. Um, Look, it's critical for Netflix to show its members that it has a library of content always available. And it also is crucial for Netflix to make an upfront investment into original content. Content, though, isn't cheap, and Netflix knows that better than anyone. Uh, The business has spent over $100 billion US dollars on content over the last nine years. This has, of course, weighed on the company's balance sheet and has fallen a fair bit since its peak in 2020, with 2020 showing cash and cash equivalents at just over $5 billion. But the market does expect this to rise by a fair amount in 2023, up almost 40% to over $7 billion. Given its upfront cost of content, free cash flow has been an issue for Netflix over the years. The company has run a negative cash flow business model where it anticipates the cost of content development and licensing through the platform. Um, These costs get amortized over the years as subscribers stick to the platform. In 2022, free cash flow was positive, and the market expects that free cash flow to more than double in 2023 to over $3 billion. Now we're going to take a look at financial ratios and margins. Now, we focus on price to earnings quite a bit on stock break, and and this has always been pretty high for Netflix compared to the market average, given its business is always focused on growth. But this ratio has continued to fall for Netflix uh, over the past few years. Netflix currently trades at 31 times price to earnings, which is pretty high when compared to the S&P 500 average of 18 times. Um, we'll touch a little bit more on sort of price to earnings shortly in the episode as well uh, when we come on to the valuation. Another important ratio for investors is price to sales. This ratio shows how much investors are willing to pay per dollar of sales for a stock. It can often be effective in valuing gross stocks um, because it is calculated by a stock's last price divided by sales per share. Currently, Netflix trades at 4.3 price to sales. This is halved from 8.9 in 2021, but it's still high compared to the S&P 500, which trades at two and a half times price to sales. Finally, on the ratio side, we're going to look at the company's debt to equity. This is a ratio that is used to evaluate a company's financial leverage. It's an important metric to measure to what degree a company is financing operations with debt rather than its own resources. Um Something important to note here is that, you know, debt can also be helpful in facilitating a company's healthy expansion. Essentially, we're looking for a middle ground with this ratio. Um, Netflix currently trades at a debt equity ratio is 0.44. This is lower than the average of the S&P 500 companies at 1.6, showing that Netflix has more equity than debt. Moving on to margins now, Um, at the end of 2022, gross margin for Netflix was 39%. Pretty impressive number, given it spends so much on producing content. Um, But the market expects this number to stay high um, heading into this year, coming in between 39 and 40%. We also look at operating margins. The operating margin measures how much profit a company makes on a dollar of sales after paying for variable costs of production, such as wages, 
raw materials before paying interest or tax. Uh, the company's operating margin has been expanding primarily because Netflix pays for its single largest expense content on a fixed cost basis. This means that every piece of content that Netflix either licenses or produces costs the company a fixed dollar amount, regardless of how many people watch it or how many subscribers the company has. So for Netflix, operating margins came in at 17.8% in 2022, which is higher than the S&P 500 average of 14%, but it has come off slightly since 2021. So now we're going to have a quick look at what's ahead for Netflix. And first, we're going to start with the challenges ahead. I think it's most obvious to start with this, but competition is by far the biggest challenge that the business uh, is likely to face moving forward, especially from legacy media such as Disney. It's a business, um, when we think of Disney, that has been around for years. It has a truckload of original content uh, that it continues to produce and has a deeper customer engagement with its parks. This is also the case with newer players such as Amazon with their Prime product and Apple with its TV product. Um, and ultimately, what we have to remember here is that there are plenty more touch points for consumers and more engagement than Netflix can offer. So when we use our phones, we order off Amazon. Um, let's say, for example, Amazon's Prime product is an all-in-one. We get free delivery, you get music, you get TV, and there can be an argument that more value lies in this type of product for consumers. Then when we think about Apple, we're using our phones almost every day if we own an iPhone, whether that's for social media, whether that's for you know work or phone calls, whatever it may be. It's an easy touch point for then Apple to reach the, the their sort of you know users for the TV product. But in this situation, I, I don't think this is going to be a winner-takes-all market. Um, I think there is going to be room here for multiple players. The key here is going to be original content. I think this will mean that consumers will turn to more than one you know, app or streaming service. If I can only watch you know, a certain show on Netflix, and all of my friends are talking about it, we'd like to use that streaming service, and that's going to be critical. The key, I think, here more than anything more recently is Squid Game. You know, Squid Game was a show that sort of really captivated much um, of the sort of the public. And that really helped people drive people to towards Netflix, particularly in, in Asia Pacific. So so that type of original content is going to be really important. Um, we also talked earlier uh, about the price rises for, for Netflix helping revenues. So rising prices, is that always a good thing? Ultimately, we, we have to remember here that rising prices um, can also sometimes mean demand destruction. It can lose subscribers at the same time. It can make plans less, less attractive to users. Um, how high can you keep rising prices before subscribers choose to switch off? Um, this strategy you know, doesn't always work well, especially when the macroeconomic environment isn't as good. Uh, Netflix CEO Reed Hastings has highlighted before that those who follow Netflix know that he's been against the complexity of an advertising model and is a big fan of the simplicity of subscription. But as much as he is a fan of that, I'm a bigger fan of consumer choice and allowing consumers who would like to have a lower price and are advertising tolerant, get what they want, makes a lot of sense. So that's pretty key here. Um, Netflix is obviously looking to diversify their revenue. They're looking to keep their subscribers by offering multiple uh, plans at multiple different price points. If you're happy to pay less and watch ads, there's going to be a plan for you. If you don't want to watch ads and you're quite happy paying the money, uh, then Netflix will offer a plan for you as well. And, and I think that's really important here is choice. Um, it's all about choice. It's not just having one option. It's about having you know the, the option to be able to choose exactly what you want. You still want to keep Netflix, but you can't quite afford to keep paying it every month. Well, then there should be an option available to you as well. So now we want to have a quick look at the opportunities that lie ahead for Netflix. Um, we covered competition earlier, and I think that one of the opportunities that Netflix can leverage is its broad and diverse base of consumers. Um, and if they do only want one app, then that is you know, going to be a key here. Um, we mentioned that we, we might see multiple apps in play, but if somebody does just want one app, I think that Netflix has something for everyone. Um, they've moved into gaming. I think sports could be one of the key focal points for longer term growth to make it sort of an all in one app. But I feel like they have kids, they have movies and they have documentaries. Uh, you know, I feel there's a bit of something for everyone in the household. I think we're, we're still in an early shift as well from cable. So, you know, streaming, uh, sorry, paid for TV. 
I think the younger generation um, are likely only turning to to sort of, you know, you know, pay TV for for sports. I think we've started to see that change. You know, we've we've got plenty of sto- sports documentaries from Netflix that have been successful, such as, uh, you know, Michael docu Mike, Michael Jordan's documentary, Drive to Survive, etc. Um, so plenty of opportunity there. Something that I also think goes under the radar is the app's performance. When we turn on Netflix, we just expect it to work every time, no questions. However, how often do we get that with tech? Um, sometimes, you know, you can turn your laptop on once a week and, and there's an issue and you're calling the IT guy. But Netflix, personally, I haven't had an issue with a Netflix show for years. You know, I turn it on and it works. And that's exactly what you want. It's consistent, reliable, and it's experienced in doing this. It's been doing it for, you know, over 20 years now. Um, That really drives loyalty, given that people just want to watch their shows with no issues. And I think that goes uh, underappreciated. And and again, for those sort of watching um, this on YouTube, you can see from that graphic that you know, these streaming problems are, are are very low. So for context, for people listening on the on the podcast, um, 0.0 streaming problems per hour watch compared to Disney Plus at 0.12. That That's big. Um, and, that, and that's a huge opportunity that lies ahead for Netflix in, uh, and I think sometimes goes under the radar. But the biggest opportunity that lies ahead, as I'm sure we all know about, but if you don't know about it by now, I will explain. Uh, That is Netflix's advertising model. Um, This is highly unique. And the opportunity for advertisers to get in front of 230 million subscribers is huge. Um, Big tech giants such as Google, Amazon, Facebook, and many other providers make billions in revenue from adverts every year. So I believe that this is going to be a huge opportunity as they diversify their revenue. Um, The street expects Netflix to have one of the largest CPMs, which is cost per thousand views um, at around $65. That would actually be close to the same level as Super Bowl prices, um, making this a great revenue opportunity. Um, So ultimately, I'm going to come back now to the business model change and and what that looks like. So uh, earlier I mentioned about that transition. So although that business transition initially went smoothly um, when we moved to um, DVDs to streaming, in 2011, Netflix managers told subscribers that they plan to do away, so get rid of the access to DVD rentals. Um, DVDs and streaming would be separated and each would cost subscribers $7.99 a month um and that streaming would be um sorry yeah so each platform would be 7.99 a month and then it would be 16 dollars there or thereabouts for both which was about a 60 percent hike the price hike uh and the later aborted attempt uh, aborted attempt to spin off the company's dvd operations enraged netflix customers uh the company lost 800,000 subscribers and the stock price dropped by 75 percent in four months Hastings wanted to get ahead of the curve and focus on streaming to disrupt his own business before someone else could do it for him. So he had a good vision. He was absolutely right with what he was doing, but this didn't come at the right time. Since that share price collapse, fast forward just to 10 years later to today, and the share price has risen by more than 3,000%, showing that sometimes it's easy to focus on short-term movements and be distracted by long-term goals. The world is constantly changing, and Netflix was aware of that. Um, Netflix share prices fell significantly last year, but it doesn't mean that this is the end of the road, and I think that goes for any investment in theories. So now we're going to have a quick look at the potential valuation for Netflix. Um, As usual, these numbers are a guide. They are rough, and of course, this is not financial advice. Uh, We're giving you three outcomes here, negative, base, Uh, and ball case. Uh, And again, just some rough numbers here that we have put together to try and give you a better idea of what's ahead for Netflix. So we've been pretty modest here across the growth numbers with our ball case at just 15% growth, uh, with average sales growth over the last 10 years at 24.5%. But as I mentioned earlier, sales growth has started to slow down already. Um, We have to remember um, that its hyper growth phase has likely passed. Um, The business is maturing, growth is slowing, as I say, and and competition is intensifying. Therefore, we'd expect its tax to increase over that time um, because profitability would increase. But we'd also expect margins to increase as well as the big business focuses more on profitability. So we've adjusted accordingly for that. 
Um, given that this is not in its hyper growth phase uh, and it is maturing, I've also given it a low price to earnings model for that. Um, so these numbers are also not far away from consensus of what the market expense, which uh, I will show shortly as well. But as we can see, um, about a, a negative 40% on, on share price on the sort of the, the negative case here on the bear case. Then on the base case, we're looking at pretty flat growth. And then on the bull case, we're looking at about 87% um, in, in share price growth over the next five years. So again, I think we've been pretty modest here, but just to sort of give you some idea of growth moving forward. And here's just a quick look at consensus for 2027, um, pretty in line with the numbers that we already have. So let's summarize everything that we've covered with Netflix to leave you with a full view of the company today. So the business model has had a few dramatic changes. So this inclusion of an advertising model shouldn't be something that phases the business. Changes can affect the business short term, as I showed a minute ago, but it can also posit positively affect the business in the future. We've also got a change in management, and that is something for investors to monitor, given it's this is the biggest management change in the company's history. But as I say, Reed Hastings is still sort of sitting by in that chair position to monitor what's changing. Subscription increases have helped revenues grow, but continued price rises can create demand destruction. So that's something to keep an eye on for an investor, given that if they continue to raise prices, will investors turn to other platforms? Netflix's costs for content are growing, but strong revenue growth alongside should support those margins. Um, ultimately, as new subscribers flow through the door, Netflix needs to keep producing content. Uh, so that's, again, something to keep an eye on. We've mentioned it plenty of times, but competition is increasing. Whether it's Disney, Amazon, Apple, Netflix is going to face content challenges over the years ahead. And it is going to be a battle that is something for investors to watch. And finally, the potential for sports addition alongside the rollout of its advertising model creates plenty of opportunity for the business and could help guide the business back in the right direction. For me personally, I think sports is going to be a huge, huge part of the streaming industry. I think you can never nail that down um, is going to really be, you know, in the front run here to to be one of the top streaming services i think you know apple and amazon have have really started there and i think netflix needs to needs to pick that up in order to stay on top so look that's it for netflix um let us know in the comments if you are a netflix investor and why remember of course to like share subscribe and let us know if there's a stock you want to see next. Uh, as always, thank you everyone for listening. And as I say, if you did listen to this in podcast format and would like to watch with the slides, please head over to YouTube. There is the link in the bio. Thanks everyone and see you next time.